What's up, Brave Arts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of A Scary to Remarry, wanting you to love fearlessly. We have a special guest with us today. He is a shareholder of ST, STG Divorce Law. He also enjoys solving challenging problems and has a very common sense practical approach. He is a fellow in the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, a premier professional organization of family law attorneys. He concentrates in family and divorce law, post-divorce matters, and prenuptial agreements. He's also the author of the best-selling book, I Just Want This Done. He's a top-rated lawyer in the year 2021 and 22, and I'm sure he's going to just continue to be an awesome divorce lawyer until, you know, <laughs> who, who knows when. Uh, he has crazy views on TikTok. I was watching his videos the other day. Very informative. Ray Farts community, let's show some love to Rayford Palmer. How are you doing, sir? Thank you, Sean. I'm great. I'm glad to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. I had the awesome opportunity to connect with you on social media and start tweeting and all the other good stuff. So I said, yeah, this is who I'm looking for. Thank you. Yeah, I love your content. So I thought it was a natural. Thanks for having me on the show. Yes, not a problem. Let's jump into today's segment. You wrote a blog for Newsweek entitled The Five Most Common Marriage Problems I See. Can you discuss those five problems? Yeah, my pleasure. So um, I got, I was asked by Newsweek to talk about sort of the five things that people typically talk about when they come in for consultations and divorce. And, and so the five common marriage problems, and we see, I would say, start with infidelity. So, you know, cheating, mm -hmm. I'll go, I'll list them, and then we can kind of break it down and talk about the, the pieces inside there. So infidelity, so some kind of emotional or physical affair is obviously a major one. Growing apart, the, the two people drift apart in some way. Uh, they they don't, it's like they've fallen out of love or one person's fallen out of love with the other or maybe they both want to part ways. Uh, differences in values. So value differences can be a major one that tend to accumulate over time. And we'll, we'll talk about that in some detail too. Then also mental health issues, which may be, be a little more obvious, but can be a major problem. Depression, anxiety, or more serious ones, people, you know, schizophrenia, uh, psychosis, other major psychiatric issues can obviously dramatically impact or damage a relationship. And then um, I would say somewhat tied into that, a little related to that is addiction issues, whether it's alcohol, drugs, shopping, excessive spending, gambling, all those kind of things combined to cause major damage to a marriage. And those are probably the top five issues that we see when folks come and talk with us and say they want to get a divorce or they're thinking about it they're talking about one of these five or a combination of these five issues mm -hmm. well yes i and, and i believe it because two of those were on my list when when i when i went through a divorce yep. so yes that am um, a great article so i'll Thank make you. sure i'll tag that in the uh, description below for those who want to read that in detail as well yeah, so if you do you want to talk about each of these things one by one or what what did you want to know about we, i'm happy to talk about any of these issues yes let's let's talk about them because i i think it's important because i know we can see it from an overall arching theme but coming from your expertise i would like for you to just talk about them a little bit more in detail sure i'm, I'm happy to and one thing we've said is after you see all these people getting divorced you almost wish you could talk to them before they got to us and say, hey, we see these warning signs, you know, we could steer you away from this. Or if you do this and this, maybe you can avoid this situation. Sometimes you can't, but maybe you can fix it ahead of time. And I think one of the problems and one of the issues in my own marriage was by the time I realized we were in trouble, it was too late. So by the time we started taking action, it was, we were, it was too far gone at that point. And, uh, that can be a problem is folks don't identify the problems or they don't take action early enough, even if they do, and they run into the rocks and it becomes too late to fix something. So I'd like to say optimistically, it's never too late, but realistically at some point people have had enough and, and there's sort of an emotional bridge that gets crossed. Mm -hmm. And 
one or both people have a hard time repairing it, that and getting back across. So anyway, to start with these things, to talk about infidelity, obviously it's a major problem leading to many divorces. It could be one person or the other. It's not necessarily male or female. We have plenty of cases where the female person's the one with the affair. And now with internet and social media, it can be an electronic affair. People don't might not even see each other in person, but there's all kinds of communication. There's intimate discussions going on, videos, photos, all that stuff happening. And it's it's still a form of cheating. So it's draining energy from the marriage. You know, it's like a vampire sucking blood out of the life of the marriage. And, and all of these things are like that. They're all pulling energy away from the relationship, mm -hmm. you know, damaging it in some way. And with infidelity, you know, you're supposed to be devoted to the other person and it's draining all of that or a lot of that energy away from the relationship and, and putting it into somebody else. It typically, and there, I've seen two kinds of affairs. And I've seen on the internet, everything from two kinds of affairs to 10 kinds of affairs, depending on what you Google and what you research. But I think it comes down to two major things. One is the um, affair that's trying to fill a need and it's a one-time thing. So the person is missing something in a relationship. They're not normally somebody who would seek out a relationship mm -hmm. and they would rather be, have a happy marriage. You know, I think most people go into marriage on their wedding day. They don't think, gee, I can't wait to get divorced. You know, everybody gets married and they're happy on that day. Uh, and they're excited and they're glad to be married. And well, somewhere along the way, that's not the case anymore. And they're looking for something typically missing. Some of their needs aren't being met, emotional, physical, sexual, whatever, or just intimacy and somebody talking to them, holding their hand, whatever it may be. And they start seeking that need somewhere else. Or an opportunity comes along where somebody offers to fill that need and they might not have considered going anywhere else until the opportunity popped up. Mm. And with the internet and social media, a little bit of texting seems safe. Like, well, I'm really not cheating because I'm just talking to somebody and it starts draining energy from the relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, so typically there's the one that's somebody trying to fill a, a missing need. And it's probably not somebody who would cheat again. This is uh, trying to meet something that's missing. And it takes a lot of energy to, to do that. And, fear and you people are worried they're going to damage their relationship or get divorced or whatever and they they probably are rather happy in their relationship otherwise they love their kids they'd like to be married but they're missing something mm -hmm. and they're looking for this elsewhere eventually they get desperate then the other kind is the person that just should never get married they call them a dog or whatever it is this is a person that they just like the thrill of the chase and they let, they get excited about sneaking around and this is a game they play. And I think the one is fixable. The, the person that it's a one-time thing or it's to miss, fill a, a missing a gap in their needs with, if they can reconcile, if they can put things back together and trust can be rebuilt, I think that's much more fixable. The mm -hmm. second one, you're never gonna fix. If, if the person is, a cheater and they're a serial cheater this is just their game and they just shouldn't be married period mm -hmm. and i've we've had cases like that you know mm -hmm. I, I had a woman come in this is many years ago it's the shortest marriage i've ever done it was 17 days it was a two-week honeymoon and plus three days and she came into the office three days after honeymoon and said he cheated on the honeymoon <laughs> i don't know it i don't you have to be a dog if you're cheating on the honeymoon so but then she had said he cheated on her when they were dating. He cheated on her when they were engaged. And she thought it would get better. Like, well, if I get engaged, we make a commitment, it'll stop. And then if we get married, it'll really stop. Mm -hmm. Well, this is that thing about tigers not changing their stripes. And, and so you see that that pattern is more, I think that's more rare. The, the person that's just sort of a serial cheater. And this is kind of a, it's a personality defect or a psychological issue they have. That's not fixable. Those people are never going to stay married. I so th those are the two kinds of infidelity really that we see. And then, like I said, with all the various flavors, it's, you know, internet cheating, exchanging videos, seeing people in person, you know, any number of those things. Yeah. 
because uh, I, I heard I was listening to a pastor one day and he said, you know, having a wedding ring on doesn't turn you into a superhero. That's a great point, right? And, and they don't, you know, even if you go through pre-Cana, you know, I, I was brought up Catholic and we went to pre-Cana and the mm -hmm. priest talked about all this stuff. And I, as an aside, I find it interesting that a person that's usually never been married is talking to you about marriage, but that's beside the point. <laughs> usually they do have some, like lay people talk to you too, which is a good thing. Good. But they, you take a test, you know, talk about your, how your personality matches up. And that's a good thing. But when you're 21 years old, like I was, mm. you don't fully even understand yourself. And some of your values and, and that are maybe inside you, but they haven't had time to develop yet. Mm. Things about children and family, you might not even realize yet until years later. Mm. So, um, so you married right. at 21. I was married at 21, yeah. Really? Well, I was, I'm married at 24. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and I was and divorced I, at 40. Yeah. I was divorced in my mid 40s. It was been several years ago now. And I was married 24 years and we had a lot of great years. And it just things didn't work out. And we had an amicable divorce. And it's, um, I, I'm remarried. I'm very, I'm a person who wants to be married. I'm not a lone wolf kind of person. So, um, I'm guessing more people are like that. They want to be with somebody ultimately. Yeah. I think if it, if it's the right, if it fits. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm getting off track. I'll, I'll get back to it. So with, with the affairs, the one thing I wanted to mention too is, and you you might've seen this, that we'll, we'll have people come in and say, um, the affair caused the divorce. But really, in my experience, from what I've seen, mm -hmm. the affair is a symptom. It's not the disease. The disease is a breakdown in the relationship of one sort or another. The affair is, is a symptom showing there's a problem in the marriage. If the marriage was good, there would be nobody. No, unless we're talking about cheater number two, who is just going to do it no matter what. Mm -hmm. But if the marriage is otherwise healthy, nobody's going to be seeking anything outside the marriage. So right. to me, it's a, a symptom of a breakdown in communication, the sexual relationship, the, mm -hmm. the intimacy in general, you know, that, that leads to somebody seeking intimacy outside. And many times it can be emotional, not just sexual. We always think of the sexual affair part because that's the part that's cool and it gets TV headlines and stuff, or that's what people want to see on the cheaters show. But <laughs> that I think it's probably far more emotional than people would credit it. You know, there's a lot more communicating that's going on than, than actual sexual stuff. So, yeah. And, you know, I want to talk about that for a second, because I did a poll about women. How do they feel? Would they forgive you more for physical cheating or emotional cheating? Most women said they would they can get over the one night stand. They can't get over the, the, the mental piece, because once you connect with another woman mentally, everything else falls in place like you know obviously with the body and stuff so i when i heard you say that i was like wow yeah that was interesting that i hear women say that i mean cheating is cheating don't get me wrong right but of the two lesser evils yeah i, I think i can totally see that and i've seen that in the clients that have come to talk to us over the years and this is now thousands of people i've talked to over 20 plus years and it's uh i understand that because the emotional thing means there's been a complete sort of psychic break or emotional break within the spousal relationship that they're going to connect emotionally with another woman or man. Mm. Well, that's a, it's, it's one thing if it's like just a sexual need, I suppose, mm. but if it's emotional, you, I can see how people would say that. That's interesting that the survey turned out that way, but I get that. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that makes sense from what I've heard too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so the, the next thing, I'm sorry, do you have a question? I apologize. Oh, no, go ahead. Because I think you're about to get into the second one, which I really want to talk about. I, I really want you to discuss, which is the, uh, I think, growing apart. Yeah, the growing apart thing is interesting. And, and obviously, some of these things tie in these different categories. But growing apart is, uh, you'll hear people say, uh, they changed. You know, you'll hear, wow, they changed. So we're getting divorced. You know, I, they're different now. I really don't think people change. I think times change, people don't. Mm. I think people eventually become who they really are. And I know it sounds funny, but we're, I think we're, our personalities are pretty well formed by the time we're 12 or 13 years old. Mm. And we try on different hats as we're growing up through our teenage years and college year, whatever, you know, early twenties. 
And at some point we kind of come back to center. Mm. I really believe that. And there's some, there's some scientific uh, connections with that. There's, there's really? been research. Yeah, you, you're right on. So this is kind of something I've sort of put together over time because from observing people, you know, in my life and in my work. And I don't know that people really, it's very hard for people to change. I mean, the, the diet book industry is a billion dollar industry. Well, they don't say anything different. They say, eat less. That's every diet book ever, right? Don't stuff your face. That's the diet book. And, you know, the workout books say, go to the gym, you know, go walk, go run. They're, I mean, it, but people keep buying the books because we change is hard. It's very hard. And we like inertia. Humans don't like to move. We, we like to be comfortable. And we only move when there's like a woolly mammoth coming at us mm -hmm. or a lightning bolt or, you know, there's a thunderstorm and that's okay. That's, that's how we're wired, you know, biologically is, is we have fight or flight, but otherwise we kind of sit there and save up our energy. Mm -hmm. So change is, is difficult. So I don't think, I don't think people really change, but times change and reveal the differences that probably were always there. For example, I'll use my, so my own example. In my own life, my ex-wife was a grew up on a farm, mm -hmm. and uh, a real legit farm with cows and corn and pigs and everything. And I'm from the suburbs in Chicago, mm -hmm. and I grew up in a. My parents both had jobs and kind of traditional situation, mm -hmm. and uh, my ex-wife grew up working every day on the farm, mm -hmm. and the farm is your life and your work. Well, our family, we work to play. Her family works to work. Mm. work has its own value in the way that she's raised and money is something to be stored and and saved and protected now i'm not you know i don't spend every penny i make down but my parents philosophy was money is a tool to be used to have some fun and enjoy your life along the way and yes you want to save some money but uh if we want to buy some of the finer things that's okay mm -hmm. and those values initially when we didn't have any money well didn't matter we didn't have anything anyway and we were working super hard going through school i was in law school she was going to grad school we had this tiny apartment then we, we bought a little house once i became a lawyer and she was teaching and we were working our butts off to get the house together and we got, had kids young you know we got married young we were in this big hurry to grow up mm. and i was on board with that it's okay well eventually we had the money we had time and our kids were getting older and my values were that I like to spend some money and she doesn't like to spend money. Um, and we had other different values that sort of became evident as time passed. And, and I, we talk about value differences later, but it blends into growing apart. So eventually people can grow apart when they, they don't share common interests. And I'll tell a story that I, I talk about in the article too. So, and this is a client story. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges is if you don't spend time together and you don't go on vacations or date nights together, you don't have any adventures together and they don't have to be expensive. You don't have to spend any, a lot of money. But if you don't share time together, like you did when you were dating, you're, you're going to get on your own channels and not pay attention to each other. You just start getting in your own groove and you stop focusing on the relationship and it just get you get into this very individ, individualistic world and you start drifting apart. And an example I give is was a real case where a client of mine was really into outdoor fitness. Like she liked to bike, she liked to go kayaking and stuff like that on the weekends. And she, she got interested in this after her kids were a little older, she had free time again and she wanted to do this stuff. Her husband was a guy who liked to sit and watch football, you know, and sports on the weekends. And he just said, you go ahead and go, I'm not interested. So she would go out on her own and do this stuff. And then she did some of this stuff with a group of people and then found out the neighbor husband, the guy next door, liked this stuff too. And they started every weekend, they started riding a bike together. And the husband thought, this is great because you know <laughs> I don't have to do it. <laughs> and right. I don't like it. And this guy's doing it fine. And she's having a good time. And eventually it turned into a romantic relationship. It didn't start that way. She wasn't thinking about leaving the marriage. She had no, no desire to do that. But eventually she shared all these common interests with this guy next door. 
and they were having they were guess what they were doing they're riding their bikes they were talking for hours and they're and they're canoeing together whatever kayaking they're talking for hours and eventually that's intimacy kind of and yeah. it it started to supplant the other the, the marriage relationship because the husband which just wasn't interested in getting involved in what his wife was doing now do you have to do everything together no that's not realistic you know my i'm i'm into collecting toy trains does my wife care about that no she thinks it's nerdy well you know she doesn't have any interest in that stuff well <laughs> that's okay we got different interests mm -hmm. but uh we do we always go on date night together and we try to travel together and it again it doesn't have to be expensive but do you can you you know play cards on a friday night with a couple of your friends or something with your wife you know have the have conversations go for a drive you know go for a walk yeah but people start they stop spending time together and when they were dating they invested all this time in each other and they stop investing time and they think well i'm married so you know it's automatic we're married we're good it you have to constantly invest time in the relationship or it will it'll fall apart i agree and it's, that's exactly. the marriage takes work thing. And the work can be a lot of fun, mm -hmm. but you have to invest the time. Yeah. And, and, and that helps avoid the growing apart thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the date night is very important. And I, I think sometimes, sometimes people look at marriage as like just the apex of relationships. And all of a sudden I have this person and now I don't have to do anything else because I, you know, I crossed yeah. the, the, the line. That's right. That. And and also you have to really you realize that just like a job, you know, you earn your paycheck every two weeks. You know, you're only good for the next paycheck, you know, <laughs> when you have a job. And I'm only as good as my next client and the next person to buy my book, you know, that's it. And right. I have to keep making people happy. Well, it's you're right. In a marriage, nobody teaches you this stuff when you're 21, 24 years old. Nobody says that you'll hear things about date night or whatever. Okay, that's like somebody just mentioning that you need to do networking or whatever to grow your business. <laughs> It's this vague concept that nobody tells you how to actually do it. Yeah. Well, okay, well, how often is date night? What what does that mean? You know, how do I, what, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Well, like you said, it's a constant investment in time. You get a great point, apex in the relationship. That's what I thought it was. I thought, oh, we're married, okay. It'll just be like my parents and they always seem to get along great. My parents are still married. Mm -hmm. And you know, any disputes they had were behind closed doors. I just thought I'm going to have a great relationship like my folks. And, and I didn't really know. I thought you're just supposed to talk about your feelings and we're going to do stuff together and we're going to buy a house together and we'll have kids and that's all. That's it. You know, it'll be good. Well, yeah. you don't know that we need to go on walks. We need to go get coffee together for half an hour, an hour talk with each other and just listen to the other person when they talk about how hard their day was and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, and earn, you got to earn it every day in some way that's and, right you know it, it's like it's like fitness for your body you've got to earn that every day you know you need to go for a walk or take care of yourself a little bit daily or the wheels eventually come off and it's the same relationship yeah but nobody warns you <laughs> yeah you have to be intentional you have to wake up every day to be intentional every day that's right yep. yeah and it, it's like a good friendship too if you don't stop calling they're not going to be your friend anymore <laughs> that's right you know, you're not you're not such a good friend if you don't talk to them or spend any time on them it's just but for some reason when we get married we get the piece of paper we're like well we're good you know mm. we're married now so that's a good one and we want to move on to should we talk about the value differences yes i do want to talk about that but but while we was here at number two because that was my lane that's where i that's where we went oh yeah well let's we, yeah yeah where we grew apart and it was one of those things that, and, and you know and i realized too that we didn't have the friendship we had everything else but the friendship and this and that's what i realized the big difference between my first marriage and being married now sure you know, who i'm married to now because me and her are the best of friends and that makes a world of a difference so when you was talking about that i said yeah that that's that was something that worked for me was us really being friends but uh number three so no that that's so important that having that underlying relationship because uh, that will survive the tests. You know what? Every marriage is going to be tested. And if you've got the bedrock respect for each other and, and that friendship mm -hmm. underlying the, the romantic, the sexual and all that, because it's not always sexy and it's not always romantic. That's <laughs> right. Sure. There's stuff that's not that way. You're Somebody's going to be sick. Somebody's tired, whatever. 
and you know the kids are in the are all over the place and you're busy if you've got that bedrock relationship you're going to have that every day and that's going to be what you can fall back on when the times are tough and that that's so true you know yeah. so uh value differences and this one is I, we talked about it to some extent with growing apart it the value differences can be part of that like somebody values physical fitness the other person doesn't uh, you know but more like uh religious values values about money uh family extended family so a good example is uh some folks grow up in a very small family and they don't have an extended family and they marry into a large family mm -hmm. and in the small family being together with family might not be super important to them for whatever reason but in the big family they're together every sunday and the, the whole family's together grandma grandpa all the kids the cousins the whole nine yards and that's how that family just is and the person when you get married you're in a little bubble right your mm -hmm. your parents you introduced maybe introduced your uh girlfriend boyfriend to your mom and dad eventually mm -hmm. but it's only incidental your contact with your parents when you're younger especially is fairly limited and you're dating in this little bubble and you're pretending that the whole world doesn't exist except you and her <laughs> and whatever. And, and that's great when you're, the romance is taking off and that's natural. But then when you get married, the real world intrudes again. Mm. And you're actually marrying two families, not just two people. And the wedding is sort of the big wake-up call <laughs> that, oh, geez, there's 200 people in here and all these family people. And on holidays, we're going to see them. And on the weekends, my mom wants to see us and, and our and the baby and her dad or her parents want to see us. And now people are putting demands on your time and your relationship. And maybe you didn't realize when you married into this big family that they see each other every Sunday and your wife actually wants you to do that. Uh, initially, she didn't say that was an issue, but now that you have babies, her parents want to see those babies. That's and right. I better see him every week and maybe twice a week. And now you start realizing, oh, I married her mom and her dad and her mm -hmm. uncle and mm -hmm. all these other folks. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But especially when you're young, they don't warn you about that either. <laughs> no. and, and that can be a major issue because be. one person wanted to just have this insular relationship with the other person and they didn't think about the outside world very much. And now the outside world's intruding big time into their marriage and of course we can even get into the issue of parents grandparents getting like personally involved in the marriage where they start you know poking on one person or the other to do this or that and that can be really destructive but mm. uh value differences the one story i tell it uh, from a real case is represented a guy who's a real go-getter executive at a uh, large company was super successful made huge amounts of money was a very athletic guy but put tons of time into his work. And his, he and his wife raised the kids. They saved a lot of money. They would go on vacations and stuff, and that was fine. But um, he was really a hustler and worked super hard. She was a stay-at-home mom. They could afford that. And and uh, when he was in his early, like around 50, he had a cancer scare. And it really made him reevaluate his whole life. And he'd saved enough money that he could kind of retire. He'd retire early, pretty much. So he decided that he'd retire early and spend time with the kids. And also that he was into like um, surfing and like being out in nature. And he wanted to do all this adventure sports stuff while his body was still, you know, he's like, hey, I'm getting older. I'm still fit. I can do this stuff and I won't be able to do this forever. So he basically wanted to kind of travel and do this stuff with his wife. Well, she had no interest in that. Mm -hmm. She wanted to stay at home and just keep doing what she was doing. and. You know, his passion was, well, I want to go to California and I want to surf for a month and, you know, we can move around with the kids and like live this lifestyle. And, and she just had no interest at all in it. And the kids were getting older, they're getting into college age. And it became the end of the relationship really because their values were so different. And, and that made the cancer or no cancer. Mm -hmm. I suspect at some point he would have thought this way anyhow because he was interested in these things and getting older. Yeah. And I think it just accelerated his thought process. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the cancer has a way of focusing you on what's important. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you 
that's that thought exercise. Like if you knew you only had X amount of time to live, what would you change? Yeah. You know, if you only, if somebody told you you have a year to live, two years to live or whatever, what would you do differently? Mm-hmm. Well, I think he had that thought and she wasn't on board at all. It's kind of an extreme example, but it's an example of just very different values. But a lot of folks get in trouble with their values about money are different. Like in, in my situation was one of the issues, not the be all and end all, but one. Mm-hmm. Religious values can differ. And again, when you're just dating, it's no big deal. You're not, maybe you're not going to church very much because you're younger, but you get older and your family starts expecting you to go to synagogue or church or whatever. And uh, one family's really into it and they expect their child and now their grandchildren to be involved. And the other person maybe never had that experience and it, it becomes a problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or the values are very different fundamentally with raising children, how many kids, uh, what we want to do with our lives, where we want to live. Uh, any number of these things can become major issues in a marriage. And when people are optimistic and they're just dating and everything, they're they're not usually having those conversations or they might not even realize these things will become issues or they might not have fully thought through these things themselves when they're 24 years old mm-hmm. and they, they yeah. haven't had the opportunity to think through that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So th- those are, that's a big one. It's mm-hmm. Value differences can be a, you know, a major one. Mm-hmm. And what's the next one? So the next one is uh, more like this is a little more obviously mental health issues combined oh. with addiction. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously this is really sad because a lot of these things aren't necessarily the fault of a person, their illnesses, but nevertheless, super destructive to a relationship. And the the spouse of the person with the challenges, the mental health um, illness or the addiction issues, it's incredibly draining to be married to that person. It's already hard enough to be married to somebody sometimes. But when somebody's suffering the, through these things, it, it drains tremendous energy from the other person who's trying to cope, trying to deal with the fallout from these things. And a lot of times they just get exhausted and yeah. they can't take it anymore. Or the fallout from addictions, the overspending, they're broke now that you know they've got debt issues or uh, alcohol, there's a DUI, the person uh, gets injured in an accident or they're driving the kids when they're drunk and the spouse can't afford to take a chance anymore and I've had people say to me, I was okay with the drinking when it was, when we were younger, uh, I didn't like it, but I could live with it. But then now I can't let them drive with the kids. Yeah. And I, it's, I can't do it. And, and it's usually, it gets to a point where, and something about being in your forties, you know, what was, these things tend to snowball, you know, and, and a thing that was drinking every weekend in their 20s and it became one drink a day in their 30s and it became three two drinks every day after work and now it's you know now it's several drinks a night or you know I've people would drink a case of beer or some crazy thing but it gets out of control and the wheels come off and it's almost always when the kids are like in high school that the people have been married 15 years 20 years people are in their 40s and these things accumulate to a point where their body can't take it anymore. Medical issues pile up, the DUIs happen, and the spouse just says, I can't do this anymore. And they say, I put up with it, I can't do it. And they call and, and they come in, we have a consultation and they just say, I love them, but I can't take it anymore. And, and those are sad because they truly love the person and were it not for this issue, they'd stay married. And one extreme example I talk about with the gambling addiction was, the guy spent down the whole 401k, like the life savings in his fifties. And the wife said, I've got to get away from this guy. He's bankrupting me. Mm-hmm. And I, she's like, I want to, I want to, I love the person. I want to be with him, but he has this issue where he just goes and gambles behind my back. And it's, then they say, that's a form of cheating too. You know, like financial cheating mm-hmm. to an extent too. There's obviously dishonesty there mm-hmm. and you're, you're damaging the relationship's resources. You know? mm-hmm. And so it's, that's very sad to see that kind of stuff because these people otherwise have a good relationship, but this vampire is draining the blood out of the, the relationship. Mm. And, 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 and and when you talk when you talk about like the alcohol, like just from what you've seen and people that you've you've talked to, do you think the the drinking is that just a 
a small problem to something that's bigger? Well, I'm no expert on that stuff. So I, I don't know that I can address that directly. Okay. But sure, people are medicating other issues potentially. And I mean, you know, yeah, there, I mean, I'm sure there are all kinds of those things that are intertwined where they may dep be depressed. They're, they may be drinking their problems away. It's, you know, super stress, it's a poor coping mechanism. And then it becomes a thing that becomes a problem in and of itself. It, it doesn't fix the problem that they're trying to drink to feel better about to dull their senses. Then it becomes its own, you know, issue. Yeah, I'm really, I don't know that I'm equipped to talk about that really, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's what I can say is whenever you hear people tell their stories, it's typically a progression. You know, it was okay when we were dating, I thought it was okay. It seemed like it was just social drinking. And then it was, it seemed like it was one a day after work. And I didn't think that was quite right because I didn't need to drink after work. <laughs> I didn't understand it. But then it was like two, and then he started hiding the empty bottles. Well, they start hiding stuff. You got, I mean, you know, you're in major trouble at that point. That's yeah. then because that person knows they have a problem and they're concealing it from the spouse. Mm. So yeah, it's so sad. I mean, it's, you know, if, if people can get treated, I represented a, a serious heroin addict who was down and out, mm. uh, actually a brilliant young man who had everything going for him and unfortunately got caught into heroin at a, at a young age and had a child with a young lady. And he couldn't see his kid for years and, and got rehab. And he's a success story. Rehab, did all kinds of random drug testing to prove to the court that he should be able to see his child. Got very limited parenting time initially, and then proved he was okay. More and more and more parenting time until he got full parenting time and was equal time with his the mom of the child. And eventually the mom had issues and he got full custody of the child. Um, which is obviously sad for the child, but a real success story for the dad and proves there is ability to recover and that the court is forgiving about that. Mm -hmm. The court wants to see both parents involved in a child's life across the United States. Yeah. And there is, even in cases of abuse and neglect, the court wants to see that relationship repaired if at all possible. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that because when I went through my divorce, um, it, eventually I end up getting full custody of my daughter because you hear the narrative about the, the courts are against the men and, and, and things of that nature. You hear that a lot, but I was able to get full custody of my daughter after about almost two years. You know, I think it, it's unfortunate it took that long, but I think the trend has been far more move, moved towards balance in the, I would say definitely in the last five to 10 years, it started slowly 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you 20 years ago, if, if a man said to me, will I get 50-50 um, time was the question, I would just say, it's not possible. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Or will, will I get sole custody? Only if the mom was like a, an abuser, like something radical, mm -hmm. would the dad get custody? And the, I'm saying dad generically, but right. it could be anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, one, so let's say the parent that normally spent less parenting time whoever that is in the old days, 20 years ago, I'd say, no, it's going to be every other weekend, a couple nights a week. Now, this is Illinois, Chicago and area, but I suspect it was pretty typical around the country too. Mm -hmm. And over the past 20 years, certainly accelerating in the last 10 and definitely in the last five, there has been a strong move towards preferring that both parents be fully involved and that we're seeing much more 50, 50 time cases or very close. Mm. you know call it shared time and it's you know i don't like to put it on a balance sheet yeah because it's a child i know people do that because they put the days out and kind of look at the time but it's a hell of a lot closer to 50 50 than it ever was and when people ask for equal time nobody laughs anymore or, or says that's ridiculous and that used to be the response a long time ago was oh, and that's that's silly you know we've got all these dual career families mm -hmm. uh you know both people work um Fathers, I think, are generally more involved with children than in the past. I think there's some mm -hmm. truth to that. There's mm -hmm. some changing in the gender stereotypes, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all that's combined. And also we have a lot of female judges, a lot of women lawyers, a lot of female guardians ad litem and who work. And, and I think the dynamic has shifted in our culture 
to be much more accepting of all these different parenting arrangements. And as a result, 50-50 is much more common. In many states, there's a trend for the law to change to make the default equal time rather than that be something that somebody has to ask for. Mm -hmm. And it's not the case in Illinois yet. It's been tried, but uh, voted down previously. It, it might pass. It, it is a trend in other states. Mm -hmm. um, I have mixed feelings about it being a law um, because I think kids' needs vary and families are all different. So I don't, 50 50 isn't the perfect answer in all cases. Just like the dad shouldn't just have every, every other weekend. That's a one size fits all solution to me is not a good solution. Mm -hmm. I think the preference should be that both parties be fully involved with children when, whenever possible for the, that's in the best interest of the kids. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The time is moving so fast on this. Yeah. And I'm just like trying to get everything I can. I do, yeah. I, I do want to ask you who initiates divorce more men or women? And women, why? women always. Um, I, I heard a statistic that it's 60%. I've not done any independent research, mm -hmm. but I, I know anecdotally it's women. Mm -hmm. um, why? is I, I have a theory <laughs> my theory is that uh women usually women think about it for a long long time and talk to friends and family and all that and they put a tremendous amount of thought into it when they actually make the move it's been years probably of accumulated thought and I, i'm not my theory is that guys tend to not want things to change like in the in the marriage situation they like their kids they want to be at home most most of these cases even when there's a guy having an affair mm -hmm. i've had women say to me why do i have to file the divorce case He's, he just has a girlfriend he doesn't want to be married to me and i have come to this maybe unusual theory or I don't know what, maybe it's controversial, I don't know. But when there's that other, that guy, his needs are being met. He's got a girlfriend, mm. she's meeting whatever those needs are. He probably still loves his wife. I know it sounds weird, but like how is that true? Because he's having an affair. Well, he didn't move out. He didn't ask for a divorce. He wants his cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. He likes his laundry getting done. I, I'm being stereotypical. Okay, maybe that's not the case, but yeah, he doesn't want to get the divorce is stressful. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. His the kids are relatively happy. The home is probably relatively happy, and this person's just not getting their needs met in some fashion. And they're go now they've got the needs met. Like I said about that one kind of affair where it isn't just a serial cheater. Mm -hmm. And people change is hard, so they avoid even though if their needs are being met the. The thinking is, well, I'm not going to go file for divorce. This is like a good deal for me. Mm. I've got my girlfriend and I've got my wife. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that sounds terrible. I'm not talking about the morality of it. I, right. I get it. That's not, it's not right. right. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying I think it's, I think it's real though. Mm -hmm. And I think that person would stay married because everything's okay. <laughs> yeah. Now the person on the other side of it's not okay because there's this other relationship going on and they're not getting what they need out of the relationship. And eventually they're forced to file for divorce because they're like, I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with him having a girlfriend mm -hmm. and staying married. And, yeah. you know, so I, I think women tend to file first because more men are sort of stuck in inertia mm -hmm. and are, are, they find ways to have their needs met and they'd rather also, I think also, okay, stereotypically, or at least demographically, they're the wage earner the trend is changing right. but they tend to be more the primary <clears throat> wage earner they stand to lose more financially in a divorce mm -hmm. than the other person so why are they in a hurry to go file it is usually that's my opinion yeah i don't have stats to back that up i have heard that more women file than men i'd actually like to do that research i'd be interested to find out but mm -hmm. i think it's true mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I agree because I was doing some research on that as well as well. And I was just like, wow, it's just there's so much information in that alone. Like you said, as a woman, when she contemplates, she will give you all that she has. And, and once she make that decision, when she pull the trigger, it's it's she's done. 
I, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. And I, I think um, it's just how we're, you know, men are much more wired in a linear fashion. We're hunters, right? So mm -hmm. we we have a target and we go after it. And, mm -hmm. and women are gatherers. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I always think of their, that this may be stereotypical too, but how we're raised, you know, we're raised in a competitive environment, you know, boys play sports together and we, we understand rank and, and hierarchy. And, and these, these roles are blending. These, yeah. these roles are changing to some extent, yeah. but there's still a lot ingrained in the cultures with boys being raised to play sports and be competitive and understand rank and hierarchy and, and goal setting and reaching targets. Mm -hmm. And women are more cooperative and they're taught to play socially and have tea parties. And I'm, I'm obviously these, I know I'm a Gen Xer. I'm a little old, <laughs> guy. I'm an older guy. These are a little more stereotypical, but I think in every stereotype, there is truth. That's yeah. why there's stereotypes. So obviously it's not all cases, but when you're taught to be cooperative and, and communicative and all that, it's, I think women draw on those resources in, the, in that same way and they, they want to work as a team and then they draw on their community, their girlfriends and their mom and mm -hmm. other women in their community and, and they talk about all these things and guys don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, guys will maybe talk to their best buddy, but they're not gonna go talk to six of their friends and find out their opinion about their marriage. They're, right. I mean, guys don't talk about this stuff. Yeah, right. Guys talk about sports and, you know, and stuff like that. They're not talking about, usually they're they're not telling their buddies about their, their marital problems. Yeah. Very and that true. might be a problem in and of itself because they feel like they can't get hurt. It is. You know? Yeah, it is. And, and that's and that's one of the very reasons uh, I, I do what I do to yep. have a, a, a safe community for men to be able to express themselves. So I think if we could start changing that narrative, we maybe could see more healed marriages maybe. I think you're providing a really valuable service and, and it's it's so important to open that conversation because guys were taught not to show their feelings. You know, you, you don't talk about these things. You know, your your marriage is supposed to, and I was raised in a household where I didn't really know what to do. My parents' marriage just seemed like it was great. And so I didn't have any tools for arguing with my spouse or having a challenging conversation. I didn't know what, you know, do you yell, do you talk? I mean, my family's, seem to be talkers well in her family they like when they're angry they raise their voices well that that's not my style well interestingly enough we later learned those our communication styles were totally different when i raise my voice it's only because somebody's about to get hurt or killed you know like yeah <laughs> well i gotta be super angry and it takes a lot for me to get there but i would be telling my wife very serious things that i wanted to have happen in the relationship or concerns i had but i wasn't yelling well, I don't think that was really resonating with her because that's not how she was raised. Mm -hmm. You raise your voice and you get angry. And then you know that you're, that's a, you're sending the message. You know, that's those, those love languages and how we communicate are real important too, to make sure those are meshing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Oh my God, this has uh, been really good. I'm going to have to, we're going to have to reschedule and do us like a part two or something. Okay, that's great. There's so much more that I want to discuss uh, in detail. Uh, okay. We kind of, you know, got a little bit off track, but I think we have covered a lot of amazing ground uh, to be able to help those who are listening. Uh, I, I definitely want to acknowledge you for all the work that you do. Uh, Thank you. And, and you know, through your counsel and going through helping people through divorce, because I think it takes a certain, and you might notice as well, that it takes a certain amount of bravery to, to go through a divorce. It does. You know, it does. And we, we want to help people get divorced better. Uh, we know it's hard. We want to make it easier, not harder. And uh, we like, we work for smart, successful people. We want to make it as easy on them and their families as we can. And too many people waste too much money and emotional energy in divorce. And we want to fix that. That's our goal. It's our mission. And that's what the book's about. And that's what our law firm's about. So I, I thank you very much and and uh, for having me on the show. And there's more information on the books available on Amazon and also uh, Barnes & Noble. It's, I just want this done. How smart, successful people get divorced without losing their kids, money, and minds. Um, it's a bestseller, uh, audiobook. Kindle, you know, whatever format people like. So thank you for the opportunity. And I hope people get some value out of the book. I I don't talk about boring 
stuff like child support and alimony and technical things. It's mindset, strategy, the way to think about uh, how the case works, how lawyers think, so that people can get a leg up and understand how this whole world works and why things are happening the way they are and how to avoid the common problems that people fall into and how to do it better with themselves and their kids. Thank you very much. I love it. And let everyone know how they can get in touch with you through social media. What are your social media handles? Where can they find you? So it's pretty easy to find me. If you Google Rayford Palmer, it's easy. I'm at Rayford Palmer on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok. And also I'm Chicagoland Divorce Lawyer is my handle on TikTok. Um, the great place for all that stuff is I just want this done.com is the website for the book. And our website for the law firm is stglawfirm.com. Mm -hmm. So I'm, yeah, I'm very easy to find on, on uh, social media, got articles coming out constantly and <laughs> lots of resources on the book website. If you just go to Amazon and find the book or type in my name, Rayford Palmer, I'm very easy to find all over the internet. Thank you so much, Sean. I appreciate it. Oh, not a problem. I'll make sure I have everything linked up below in the description. Rafe Hearts community, you heard it from here. Make sure you go and connect with Rayford. As you can see, he has a wealth of wisdom and he's been doing this for a long time. And I'm honored to have someone of his stature on the show. So make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this with someone. You might be going through a divorce. You, you know, you know, you might be contemplating divorce. This video can be for you or maybe a family member. You never know. So make sure you share. If you are listening via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. By doing so, that will put you into that will enter you into a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who wouldn't want a free Amazon gift card? So make sure you leave a rating and review. This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach with special guests. Rayford Palmer. All right, people. Take care. Thank you.